So I'm going to make a few remarks about uh, Cython, which is what he'll be talking about today. And um, so I have I had a lot of experience working with the Magma group. Oh, why is this is still not working? Um, no, no. I just, you have to set the input source. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'll play with my name and keep talking. Auto source. Or you can set auto source. Uh, yeah, okay, so now it should work. <coughs> and now it'll flip through until it finds this. Okay, so digital RGB. Yes. Okay, good. So Cython, which is what I'll talk about. So, um, so I worked a lot with the Magma group. You might want to check if that's working. I worked a lot with the Magma group on Magma. There, I learned um, very visibly that how a lot of code gets written is that somebody um, would go in and write stuff using the Magma interpreter, and then they would discover that it's too slow. And then the code would very, very laboriously, painfully, and error-prone be translated into C, literally translated straight into C, and then the C code would then be what's maintained, probably by a different person. Because the person who writes the interpreter code usually doesn't know C very well, or even if they do, they don't know. I mean, there's one, it's one thing to know C, which is something you can learn in a few weeks. It's quite another thing to know how to um, write against a large existing C library. So with Magma, you know, there's literally millions of lines of code there. There are lots and lots of functions, conventions, macros, and so on. And um, to get up to speed with using all of that can be quite difficult, even if you know C already. So um, nonetheless, that, that was sort of a basic requirement for writing really good, fast code. And Magma is very, very good at, fa at being fast at a lot of things, was, um, or is, in fact, that you have this C level. So there's almost a picture you can draw where you have a C level or a compiled level or layer or something. And then above that you have an interpreter level. And some um, proportion of your mathematical software system is written at this level and some proportion is written at that level. And what often happens is there's, there's sort of this little funnel that uh, feeds code from the interpreter level down here. And over time, a lot of, in some systems, a lot of code gets moved this way. In Magma, um, most of the system is down here. Other systems like Maple have most of the code up here. Um, and the relative speeds of the systems is sometimes determined by how much is written up here or down here. Algorithms can make a big difference, but after a while, everybody uses essentially the same algorithm to do something. And then uh, how you implement it can make a massive difference. So, even if you're using exactly the same algorithm, implementation can make a factor of 100 difference in speed easily. So it does matter where you implement something, maybe even more than 100. Um, so anyways, I just kind of kept that in mind when I was trying to figure out how to implement Sage. And um, I learned about Python, and I read something called the Python C API reference manual when I was flying back from Europe um, for some reason in 2004. Which, by the way, it's some free reference manual that's available on the Python website. And I strongly recommend you flip through this um, document. Because what you'll find out is that Python itself, you can view it as simply a C library. Um, there are a whole bunch of C functions that you can call from any you know, C program that really define how Python works behind the scenes. So completely independent of the interpreter, you can view Python as a C library. And um, so I started reading this and realizing writing code against that would be very powerful. In fact, very similar to exactly what the Magma people did, except I wouldn't have to write anything from scratch because they already because Python already exists and it has a really nice, clean kind of interface that's nicely documented between writing compiled code and interpreted code. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of hard work that you have to put into writing code at this level. You have to do reference counting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's really, really easy to accidentally introduce memory leaks to um, think that there's something at a certain memory location that isn't there, to dereference a pointer twice and have and get a seg fault. That sort of thing happens all the time in C programs. And it's responsible for a lot of um, ways in which people can hack into computers. They find some sort of buffer overflow and pop. Um, but in mathematical software, it just means that you get wrong answers or your program crashes randomly, etc. And in Magma, um, I know that when I used it a lot, very frequently it would give these funny errors where it would say internal error in Magma has occurred. And say something about molten lava, and then you have to 
I don't know why I had something about molten lava, but then you'd have to restart the program completely because something would get inconsistent about the internal memory. And a lot of that has to do with all the manual memory management that you have to do when you program at this level, if you really, really care about speed. Um, so I decided, okay, well, I'll try to write something in Python to auto-generate code that would be at this level. And I started looking at doing this, and fortunately, I quickly discovered something called Pyrex, which in the context of Python, um, kind of sits intermediate between these two levels. It's like a funnel, I guess. It takes code that basically looks like this code, maybe with some slight modifications, and automatically produces code that gets compiled here. And um, Pyrex is pretty neat, but it's developed by one guy named Greg Ewing um, for, it seems like, a couple of weeks each year. So somehow, maybe over Christmas break or something, he just goes crazy and does an amazing amount of work on Pyrex. Um, and during the year, he'll answer lots of support questions, but you just get the feeling that it's a one-man show that happens every couple of weeks, or a couple of weeks each year. Um, so I had some ideas for things that absolutely had to be changed and fixed in Pyrex in order for us to use it in Sage, um, which were like really, really basic things that just, it was crazy that Pyrex wouldn't do them. So I figured out how to do them and sent the patches to Greg, and then he said, sorry, um, I don't like your changes. And I just sent them again, he said that again, and I just threw up my hands in frustration, and um, they had a fork of Pyrex, which we called, which uh, Tom Boothby, who was right there, named Sage X, which wasn't a very good name because um, people wanted to use it who had nothing to do with Sage. And this, this whole situ situation where you have some interpreted code and you kind of want to turn it into something compiled, that's something that has nothing a priori to do with Sage. Um, so having this be part of Sage and have a name like that wasn't so good. Um, in fact, you said that once a fire, a local fireman wanted to compile some Python code, so he downloaded all of Sage just so he could use SageX inside of Sage, which was kind of ridiculous. Um, so we changed the name to Cython, which is just a kind of abbreviation for compiled Python, and then started a separate project. And um, Robert Bradshaw, who's a graduate student who's right here, has done most of the work on um, Cython. He's the lead developer of that project. And he will give the rest of the talk today. So, Robert Bradshaw. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Cython. So who here has seen Cython code? Okay, so actually all of you should be raising your hands because almost all Python code is also Cython code. Mm. And so you can take basically any of the um, Python that I've seen so far, you could just put it, throw it to the Cython compiler and it will turn it in, it will treat it as if it was Cython code. So um, as mentioned, Cython is an optimized, um, feature-rich fork of Pyrex. It was motivated by Sage, but it turned out a lot of other people wanted something like this too, um, which is why the Cython project was developed. And uh, William Stein already explained what uh, Pyrex was. So, um, <coughs> the benefits of uh, <coughs> Cython is it allows you to um, statically declare your types. And um, among other things, this, this makes things run a lot faster because in Python, everything is an object. And whenever it wants to do anything, it says, oh, does this object support addition? It does a whole bunch of work to figure out if it supports addition. And if it does support addition, how do I do that addition? And then it actually goes and adds it. And then the other really good thing is you have integration with external libraries. So for instance, um, there's a <coughs> project called GMP, which is kind of the de facto library for doing arithmetic with really big integers. Integers that are too big to fit in a 32-bit or 64-bit computer's um, standard register. And rather than trying to re-implement this in Python, which would be really slow, or even um, trying to re-implement it in something like Cython, um, it makes it really easy to call this library to do all the work and then create an interface between that side of the things in the C library and your Python code, which is what Sage, for instance, is written in. And then it does a lot of the uh, uh, memory management and conversions and stuff for you. Um, although, if you want to do um, really fast things, sometimes you have to do malloc, realloc, and free. There are um, C functions that say, give me a chunk of memory. And one thing to keep in mind is computers are just really good at manipulating chunks of memory. That's what they do really well. And so computers don't think of things as, oh, I have an integer here, and I have a string here, and I want to like find you know, 
how far into the string the first occurrence of A is. Um, computers think of things in terms of, I have a bunch of bits, and I can compare them and move them around. And, um, but if you write at things at that level, sometimes you, for instance, try to access a set of bits that doesn't exist. And so um, you do have a potential to seg fault. So to give you an idea of some of the, uh, <clears throat> the um, code that Cython gives for you automatically, here is a simple Cython program. Let me make that a little bigger. I assign um, a to the vari variable a, the value 2, and then I print 1 plus a. So if I execute, actually just a sec. So if I execute this, one thing you'll notice is that it does take a little bit longer to actually execute. Because what's going on here is it's actually, unlike Python, which is an interpreted language, it's actually compiling a file and then running the compiled version. So as expected, we get the answer is three, and then um, here's the output of that program. So you can see, you wouldn't want to write all this by hand. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so when Cython does a lot of this stuff automatically, and the other thing is if you mess up on something like this, for instance, um, say right, where's that? Say I forgot one of these right here. Um, I suddenly have a memory leak, and I have to go through my entire code base and say, well, where did I not do a X deck ref? And um, if I didn't do that, then if I ran my program, suddenly my computer would run out of memory because it asked for a whole bunch of memory and never gave it back. So, um, so Cython handles all of the memory ref counting stuff for you. So <clears throat> the other nice thing about Cython is you optimize only what you need to optimize. So lots of times when you're doing an algorithm, for instance, if you're computing with modular forms up here, what it really boils down to is can you do exact linear algebra very fast? And so in the interpreted level, um, you want to have all the nice pretty looking code of create a matrix, find the echelon form of the matrix, um, find out what the matrix rank is. and that's really nice to write in the interpreted level, and the, only the actual echelon form algorithm needs to be down here in the compiled level, level, because that's where you're spending all your time. And I think there's a saying in computer science that 90% of your time is spent in 10% of your code. Um, so, so you really only need to optimize little bits of your code that you use over and over again, and then your whole program usually gets faster. So the other nice thing is, unlike um, Magma, for instance, where you have this, this is the Magma script, and then here is C++ against some very complicated Magma library. Um, it's easy in Cython to migrate code and developers. So if you have a piece of Python code, you don't have to sit down and look at the Python code line by line, and then write, as best you know, line by line C code that does what that Python code is doing, and then go and debug your C code, because invariably you've introduced bugs if you have, you know, seven pages of Python code, you probably didn't translate that 100% correctly. Um, and then also for developers, um, for instance, there's a lot of people who understand code at this level who've never, you know, touched C++ or C. And what Cython does is it allows all the people who already know this to create this kind of code without having to learn a whole new language or just learning a little bit here and there, but it's basically the same language. And then the other thing is you can also um, do it piece by piece. So you can take one part of your um, program that you think is slow, you can turn it into Cython, and you don't have to create, you don't have to turn the whole surrounding part of your program into Cython to take advantage of one little piece. Versus if it was in C, lots of times you'd have to write your whole algorithm C to take advantage of the one little piece of your algorithm that you want to be fast. So, <clears throat> and then um, you can focus on the higher level algorithms. Um, not the boring, tedious code like you saw in the last example. And then the other thing that's good is um, if you're using Cython in the context of Sage, you can use all the Sage stuff um, exactly as you would in Sage, so you have this huge library at your disposal that you already know how to use, and at the same time you have very fast compiled code running with it. So, um, does anyone have any questions so far? <coughs> 
Okay, so to start using um, Cython, what you can do is you can, um, I don't know, you probably learned that you can load or attach, if you're at the command line and you want to run a Sage script, you can use load or attach a .sage file and it will run. So with uh, Cython, it's a .spyx. This stands for uh, basically Sage Pyrex or Sage Python extension class. And that will take your Cython file, um, create a C file that corresponds to that, compile it, and then load it into your program. Um, the other way, this is probably the most common way, is if you're actually working on the uh, Sage library, then PYX, it's like Python extension, um, is the way to create a uh, Cython file. And then, um, if you know how to work on the Sage library, this will make sense. Otherwise, I don't know if we've done you've done the lecture on that yet. So, look at that after you've seen the lecture on developing Sage. And then um, from the notebook, this is the easiest way to get familiar with it: is just do percent Cython at the top of your file, and it will take the thing and treat it as a Cython file, as a Cython script. So, for instance, this is a Cython script. Um, so to demonstrate kind of uh, why Cython is good, it's good. So here I have a function called mySum, which just sums up the integers from 0 to n minus 1. And so I'm going to say, well, how long does it take to sum up in Python the integers from 0 to a um, million minus 1? And it takes about a second and a half. So here I'm going to write exactly the same function in Cython, and does anyone have a guess of how fast is that it's going to take? <coughs> no time at all. No. 0.02 seconds. 0.02? Okay, so it's actually going to take a little bit longer. But that's close. So it's 0.2 seconds. And the reason for that is that this S and the addition here and everything, these are still Python objects. <coughs> So you can see that we got a significant gain from just running interpreted code, but it's not as much of a gain as you would want to have. Um, so let's look, for instance, at the uh, code involved. So you can see this loop, for instance. I don't know if you can read that very well. There's a huge chunk of code to set up that loop. Um, and then to do the addition, what it's doing is it's creating, it's getting this variable s, it's increasing the ref count, doing memory, memory manage it, it's calling a number that does addition, it's calling it a function that will do some addition, then it's do some, doing some more memory management, and then it's storing that variable. So you can see there's a fair amount of overhead um, for working with Python objects. So here, now this is, true Cython code. So what I'm doing is I'm declaring this n to be a type long. And then I'm de declaring, I'm, this is a long long, it's, it's like a long but a little bit bigger, so I don't overflow. Um, I'm de declaring the variables k and s to be of type long long. What, what do you need cdef then, and not the parameters? So um, cdef, okay, that's, that's a good question. It's because in the parameters you can parse this and know that yeah. this has to be a type. Whereas if it was a statement, it wouldn't know that there's not like you know a function named long. Um, and cdef is kind of like the magic keyword that you use to declare things. And so then you have exactly the same loop. Here I'm doing this will get translated into a um, a for loop. And actually in the current the version of Cython that was just released, if I did this right here, Cython would automatically translate it into this. So does anyone have a guess as to how long this is going to take? And think more in line of your first guesses. I'll go in line of my first guess. Okay, so 0.05? <laughs> Something like that. Something like that? Okay. Right, no time at all. That was my very first one. Yeah. <laughs> so we can say, well, what about... So that's, uh, if we do 10 to the 7th, it takes 0.03 seconds. <clears throat> 10 to the 8th. So, so this loop right here is doing about, um, maybe it's taking three nanoseconds per addition. 
And actually less because there's an addition going on by increment of this. So it's about one and a half nanoseconds per addition. Um, compare that with the original one, which was 30 nanoseconds per addition. Um, and you might say, well, I can stand my additions to take 30 nanoseconds. But if you can get three nanoseconds, then uh, your algorithms are going to run faster if you're doing you know, a million additions in this huge matrix. And you want to have compiled code. So, <clears throat> um, so this is the, uh, the assumption that we're starting out with, uh, for instance, in this class, is Python is a developer-friendly language. And I've found that to be true. It's pretty easy to learn. It's pretty easy to read, even if you don't know it. And um, but the one thing that Python doesn't have going for it is that it's slow in some things. Um, and the slow is a relative term. Um, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're worried about things taking, you know, a millionth of a second versus a ten millionth of a second, then you would call it slow. But um, in reality, Python is pretty fast compared to a lot of the interpreted languages. And so what makes uh, Python slow? Well, the first thing that makes Python slow is that it, it's an interpreted language. Um, this is good because you don't have that lag time between, um, you notice when I used the Cython thing, it took, a, it took a while to return because it was actually doing a lot of work to compile it. Um, and it was compiling it into machine code and then actually running the machine code. Well, Python is interpreted, um, which gives it a lot more freedom and means that you don't have this lag time of compilation, but it does make it slower. The other thing is, um, Python, everything you do in Python is a dictionary lookup. And so if you want to call a function, what it does is it takes that function name and it looks it up in some dictionary. A dictionary is basically, we, you talked about dictionaries, right? Yep. Yeah. So everything, a method call, um, looking up variables in your module, everything is dictionary lookup. And it takes about um, 35 nanoseconds to do a single dictionary lookup on a string. And that might seem fast, but it's not fast compared to saying, well, take this spot in memory and go forward 30 bytes, and that's the spot I want to look at. Because um, that can be done in you know, one nanosecond. So um, another thing, Python has complicated calling conventions, meaning that when you call a function, you can give it optional arguments, you can give it arguments that have names, and this slows things down. It makes things really, really nice to write, but sometimes if you want to know exactly how you want to call it, it will slow things down. And then the other thing is, um, everything is an object, which is very nice from a programmer's point of view. But sometimes if I have a, you know, 32 bits that I want to treat as an integer, I don't want to wrap this in some huge complicated object that has to do memory management and all that kind of stuff. I just want to say, here's a chunk, treat it as an integer. If I add it to another thing, add it as I would add integers. So, Cython solves these problems by, first, it's compiled. <clears throat> which means that up front, right before you run the program, it goes through and it tries to figure out exactly the very fastest way to run that program. And turns it into a bunch of ones and zeros that your, your, your processor is going to understand. And from then on, it just runs that one string of ones and zeros into the processor. Um, this has an upfront co cost, but for instance, if you're, um, doing, if you're doing Sage, well, once you've compiled it, then you ship the compiled version, and then use the compiled version from then on, and you get all the benefits of compilation with none of the price. The other thing is, um, <clears throat> Cython has CDEF attributes. So here's this keyword, CDEF again, um, that allows you to look up things without using dictionaries. This is where a lot of the speed comes in. You also have CDEF functions. So a CDEF function has the same overhead as a normal C function, um, which is relatively fast and is much faster than a Python function. And then the other thing is it has CDEF types, <clears throat> where you can declare your type to be a primitive type, and you don't have to have all the extra structure that's associated with the Python object. So, <clears throat> so here's the, um, how we use the word CDEF. So I already did this example. So this is the Python code. Here it is optimized for Cython. So for functions, if I have my um, function here, notice when I call this thing, I'm still calling it as a Python function. And if I make it like this, so this is cdef long, now the thing is, this is a C function, 
has the disadvantage that it can't be called from Python, but if I call it from other Cython code, then this function call will have much less overhead. Yeah? So see that makes it like a static uh, variable? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So you'd have to declare something to be static. And then, um, so I can have CDEF classes that have methods and attributes attached to them. So I have an example of this, and this will hopefully reinforce the uh, <clears throat> stuff we did last year. So first what I'm doing here, so this right here, I'm declaring that in this file math.h, which is on every computer, I have a function called square root, which takes a double and returns a double. Now, unlike Python, the square root can't take anything else. And it, it's forced to always return this. So that's an example of, I have some function that's declared in some other library. I don't have to implement it, I can just call that as a C function. So now here's my class natural number. So it has an attribute, I call it cdef int value. What this does is, the struct, the C struct for this class is going to have a slot that holds this value. Whenever I look up this value, if it, if it has a handle, if it has a handle on my natural number, it's not going to have to do a dictionary lookup to get that value. It's just going to say, well, you know, look at where my natural number is, go in something like eight bytes, and pick that little chunk of memory, and that's my value. So here are my init function. This is similar as before. Um, notice it looks just like Python. I can raise errors, I can do all that kind of stuff. Here I set self.value equals n. Now one thing to notice here is that this thing is any old Python object. Whereas this thing here, I've declared that self.value has to be an int. So Cython, when it sees this thing here, will automatically turn this Python object into an int. And if for instance I passed in something that didn't work, like uh, for instance, let me uh, <laughs> it will give me an error. Um, so it, it tries to do this conversion automatically, and if that fails, it will give you an error. So let's make a normal natural number. So like. Uh, there it is. So I created a natural number. Now I just created a Cython class and then I printed it. And the same as with Python. Here's the repr method. It says, how do I represent myself? Well, I just take my value and I turn it into a string and I return that. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> you have is, this is a difference. I don't know if you've done anything about arithmetic functions. Mm, very little. Okay. So when you have a uh, you can define arithmetic by defining this underscore underscore add function. And one difference in uh, Cython is you don't know if self, which is the value that is getting called, appears on the left or the right. So here I'm saying I can add, and I can only add natural number to another natural number. I'm not accepting anything else. And then what do I do? Well, I return a natural number whose value is the sum of the two values. So for instance, I could do That right there. And here is A. And if I do uh, A is, uh, ignore this, this huge string here, um, is just because it takes the entire path of my notebook to make a unique string. Um, but here's, it's a natural number. That's the type it is. It's not necessarily just an integer or anything. It's a my new type. So I defined some methods on my natural number. I defined a cdef method. Bint is a return type that's like a boolean, <coughs> is even, and it will return if self.value mod 2 is 0. Then I've also defined an is odd function that returns not is even. And then I returned a is square method that uses this square root up here. So see, I have this square root method that I declared. <coughs> it says I'm going to take the square root. Truncate it. This is in Cython to cast, you use angle brackets. I'm going to turn it into an integer, which in C will just chop off all the fractional parts. And then I'm going to see if that times that is equal to self. 
So if my thing is a square, then this will be exactly the square root, and this will be true. Otherwise, like if I'm taking uh, square root of 20, this thing will be 4 point something, this thing will be 4, I'll say oh, 4 times 4 is not equal to the original value. So let's try out some of these methods. So is square false? Um, that's because 29 is not a square. So let's make something interesting. There, is square is true. Now, I want to know if something's odd. Well, 16, which is our number, is not odd. Now I want to know if it's even. And here we see this is the, the drawback of CDEF methods. Is from Python I can't call this function because I declared it as a CDEF method. Now notice that from Cython I can call this function. So right here, self.isEven works. Because I'm in Cython, I can look up this and it says I know how to do C calls and calls this function here. But from Python it doesn't. So there are disadvantages to CDEF functions. And then <clears throat> there's kind of a hybrid function. This is a CPDEF function. That means if I'm calling it from Cython, it calls it just as fast as a CDEF function. But if I'm calling it from Python, then it still works. So that's something that's handy to have. <clears throat> so then the other thing that, uh, that is handy is I already talked about interfacing with external libraries. But here, this type here is the uh, arbitrary precision integers. And so I can declare this, and then I use these functions here as if they were Python functions. Actually, I should have a block above that declares what these functions are, but this is an example of using an external library. So, so there are some disadvantages of uh, <coughs> CDEF. Um, attributes, for instance, this right here will also be an error. Because even though A has an attribute called value, I can't get at that from Python because it's a C attribute. So what I can do is I can declare this attribute to be public. So now I can get at it from Python. Now the problem is that I could say, do that, now I just reassigned it. So this isn't always what you want. Because now I have a natural number whose value is negative three. And that's obviously a bad thing. So I can declare things as read only. And now if I try to do this, it stops me, it raises an error, it says, it's a read-only attribute, you can't write to that. But, I can still read it. So notice that this value didn't get mutated, it didn't get corrupt, um, despite my attempt. <clears throat> so, um, you can have CP depth functions, like I demonstrated. So they're just as fast as C functions when you call them from Cython, but they're also accessible from Python. And then, <clears throat> so the last, so does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. So why not always use CPDEF? Yeah, so, um, so some, so you're saying instead of using DEF, we're using or, CDEF? Well, I mean, instead of using either, why not always? Yeah. Yeah, because it seems like you get the best of both worlds using CPDEF. Yeah, so, I mean, one reason is CPDEF didn't used to exist. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is, so um, <clears throat> there, there's a little bit of overhead in the code. So if you're just going to be using a method from Python, um, there's no advantage to making a CPDEF. Um, and especially, for instance, if you have a function that takes, you know, three seconds to operate, then you don't care about the fact that it took, you know, two milliseconds to call it. So there's no advantage in making a CPDEF. And a CPDEF function has to be declared um, in the PXD file, in the declaration file. 
because everything, um, as I was mentioned, is static. That means that anything that inherits from it has to be um, recompiled every time you create a CPDEF function because the, the layout of the static members have changed. Um, so there's that reason to not do it instead of def functions. Because um, for a def function, it just does a dictionary lookup. And you can stick something new into the dictionary, and it doesn't change how the other elements of the dictionary are changed. And the reason you don't want to do it instead of every CDEF function is that there is a little bit of overhead associated with the fact that it looks up and makes sure that it hasn't been overridden with a def function. Um, but most of the time, CPDEF is preferable to CDEF. Or there might be functions that you don't want the user to call. Um, you don't want to expose this function. It might be like, you know, set my value to x. And uh, you wouldn't want that on a natural number because then someone might set it to be a negative thing. So that's a good question. Are there are any other questions? Okay, so, so the common uh, pitfalls um, that people have is sometimes they use too much Python. Um, and this is in terms of Python syntax, but it's in terms of if you have compiled level code, and all the compiled level code is asks the interpreted level code to do stuff for it. You're not really going to be any better off than just running your code up here in the interpreted level. Um, so an example of this is if I uh, want to compute list of Fibonacci numbers. What I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, I'm being good. I'm declaring this i to be a CDEF variable. And then I'm starting out with 0 and 1. And then I'm saying, well, I make my next item to be the previous one plus one two back. And this function here is not going to run much faster than if you wrote it in Python, because here's a dictionary lookup here. Here's a Python. It, since this is negative, um, it's, able to, it's only able to index this as it, as it indexes thing in Python. Same here. This is going to be a Python loop here. And so really what you're doing is you're just sitting here asking the code up here to do all your work. Um, so usually, I mean, stuff like this is usually fine. But inside the inner loop, sometimes you want to think about being a little bit smarter um, about how much am I asking Python to do versus can I do any of it manually if I want to make my thing really fast. Um, for instance, mm. let me, well, So this is the uh, <clears throat> the annotated version of um, my my natural number class, and can you read this still? Is that legible? I could turn the looks, light off. That might help. Yeah, it looks better on my screen than it does on the overhead. That helps. That's maybe a little better. <clears throat> so the yellow parts are parts that call a lot of Cython. So for instance, notice this is even function doesn't call any Cython, it doesn't call any Python at all. That makes it a lot faster. This one right here calls a little bit. Um, this one right here calls a lot. So if you're writing Cython code, it's, it's handy to look at this and notice the parts that are yellow. And yellow doesn't mean bad, yellow just means potentially slower than it could be. Um, for instance, if you're raising a value error, you're going to have to call Python to raise that value error because you have to tell this level up here something went wrong. But uh, for this right here, you don't have to. So that's the first pitfall. So people will turn their code in Cython and say, well, why isn't it running faster? You know, it might be twice as fast, but I was expecting it to be 100 times as fast. And usually it's stuff like this where you're really just asking Python to do everything for you, so you're not any better off. Then the other um, thing that's common is uh, there's unnecessary conversions going on. And so if you look at this code here, you think it's going to be pretty fast, but this A here was not declared to be anything. So it says this A, I don't know anything about it, it must just be a Python object. And so what happens is it has a long, the C long, multiplies it by itself, turns it into a Python object. And then it says, now I want to add it to S. Well, now I have to turn it from a Python object back into a C long to add it to S. And so <clears throat> you have to be careful if you, that you don't get too many type conversions or you're going to kill your speed. And then the other thing that uh, happens 
is people will write CPDEFT methods or CDEFT methods, and then they won't call them as C methods, they'll call them as Python messages, methods. So here, I want to, <coughs> I have a function called dice. What it does is it just returns random, when I say roll on it, it just returns a random number from one to six. And then here I have a new function. What it'll do, it'll ask the dice to roll itself, it'll sum them all up, and then return the result of rolling n dice. So if you notice this dice here, again, dice, all it knows is it's a Python object. So when it call it, it does dice.roll, it says I'm gonna look, up, look for a method called roll. And since it doesn't know anything about dice, then it does a dictionary lookup to get to this function. And after doing the dictionary lookup, it calls this as a Python function that then finally returns the result. Versus what you should be doing is, I guess I don't have the good code. I should write cdef capital D dice this. That will tell it that this thing is actually type dice. So it'll statically declare it, say it's one of these guys, and then on this method here, it will be able to call it the fast way. So, um, so there's a, kind of a list of uh, pages. This, these slides will be up on the um, course wiki, as well as the worksheet I did. And so are there any other questions? Okay. Oh. So this uses mostly C, right? What if someone had a program in Fortran or some other language? How do you interface with Yeah. So to do that, so um, yeah, Cython takes Python and turns it into C. Mm -hmm. So to use a Fortran program, what you have to do is you have to write a C wrapper around it. Mm -hmm. But that said, um, Sage comes with something called F2Py, which makes it very easy to use Fortran code directly from Python. Yeah. Um, for example, in the notebook, if you put percent Fortran at the beginning of a cell, you can put Fortran code elsewhere, hit shift enter, and it will um, find all the procedures in your code by parsing it, compile the Fortran code, and then give you access to those functions. So F2Py, F2Py. Um, that's a big project, very much like Cython, but aimed at Fortran. Mm -hmm. um, but you could also, as you said, wrap the Fortran yeah. somehow in C. Um, but yeah, there's really, really good support for using Fortran from Python that people who do numerical computation have developed over many years. And Sage comes with a Fortran compiler also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anything else? Okay, so let's uh, end a little early and I'll see everybody on Friday. Thank you.